Hello everybody, so uh, this is the continuation of a previous video on in integrating small scale agroforestry uh, systems within a market garden scenario. And we concluded the previous video looking at um, Living Soil Garden, this is our garden in Devon in the UK, uh, which is a no dig regenerative vegetable garden. There are no agroforestry elements here, perennial elements apart from perennial vegetable beds over here, you see at the top. Um, you probably can't see my pointer here, but at the very top you can see some ver perennial vegetables and at the uh, right hand side which is the south boundary of the field you can also see the um, uh, willow and uh, herb interplanting um, so the challenges that are that we presented with when we try to integrate uh, forest garden um, ideas or agroforestry ideas perennial elements in in a market gardening scenario are um, um, several and we've already mentioned them in the previous video, but I'm just going to go through them quickly now again. Space management, because obviously we want to be able to manage shade uh, and not spend too much, not use too much space to produce biomass, not to, you know, uh, prevent access, because obviously trees can present access challenges for both machinery and humans. And workflow as well, harvesting, vegetable, harvesting vegetables in between the trees and pruning the trees in between the vegetables and things like that. Time management, we have to be aware of the succession dynamics. So the trees will grow bigger and their roots will grow longer and this will present some changes in the system. So we won't be able to run it on an annual basis, restarting every time from scratch. This shouldn't be the case in a regenerative vegetable garden either. The soil should get better and the conditions should get better biologically, ecologically, etc. In this case, we'll also get much, much better, much faster than in the case of an annual production. But also there will be some challenging presented by that. And also harvesting and pruning will present some time uh, intensive um, elements. And then we have uh, market stream diversification because obviously there's no point having extra crops of fruits, uh, plants, roots, um, biomass if we don't have a market for that or a use for that within the farm. Um, then we have the long term financial investment. Uh, due to the fact that we have to buy and plant and prune and tend to these perennial plants which won't give a harvest until a few years after the implementation of the system. And finally, we have to adapt existing models to local climate. This is a field in which there is very, very little research, very little data, very little evidence of what works and doesn't work, especially in a temperate or Mediterranean climate. Those are two different climates, but in both there is very little data. And so what I'm going to do now in this video is go through some examples, you know, without any um, uh, any pretend, uh, any, any, any expectation that this would be comprehensive, systematic, um, or authoritative. Or authoritative. I'm just going to go through the um, examples that influenced us and that we decided to uh, use as an inspiration and see how we can adapt them to our climate. But you will get some ideas of how you can adapt it to any climates. Uh, all right, so the first example I'm going to play it is uh, Aromath Farm um, by the Dutch farmer, Dutch Moreno, in France. So this video shows how he had to deal with the problem of having a um, essentially a market garden under trees, which in summer, in its climate in France, it wasn't a big problem. But uh, in, in, um, in a situation uh, like the UK, for example, or in Sweden or somewhere where there is a lot less light, it could have been a huge limitation having all of this shade. Uh, he didn't decide. So these were mature trees which were already in place. He didn't plant them in. Some of them are fruit trees, some are not. Uh, he didn't decide to prune them with a strategic uh, mindset. He just left them to be as productive as they could, but also as standard, using a, as a standard as management as possible. Apologies. Um, and then he just worked within the pattern that was already there. So this is kind of one extreme, having already trees there and working around them. Anybody can do this. This can be done in any garden. You have to just be mindful of your climate and the light. You might need to prune or remove some trees or manage them on a coppicing um, rotation so that you cut them down every now and then when they're producing too much light. You chip the wood and you use it for wood chip, for compost, whatever you want, or you use it for firewood and, and you let, leave the tree to start again. This would work well with willow, poplar, lime trees, lots of things, hazels and things like that. Obviously for fruit trees, if you do that, you can do that, but then you lose your food production for a few years. So you'd have to rotate, have fruit trees that you plant every year and you cut some of them every year. Now, this is not, I mean, it's one way of managing these systems, but again, it's not the most efficient system because it's not on a row. As you can see, it's kind of an interaction of an intersection, an overlap of a forest garden and a uh, vegetable annual market garden um, and you know there's some synergy but it's not huge 
Um, so better case scenario is Schilling Photoorganics, even though this is on much larger scale. You can see the alleys here are much farther apart. Apologies if the video doesn't run very smoothly. But essentially here you can see this is in Devon, UK, and Martin is describing the system. And there are apple trees um, along this um, along the field. And I think there's at least 20, 25 meters between the tree rows. And then there are vegetables grown in between in a standard way. There is tillage in this case. There is a tractor uh, coming in. Um, so this is not necessarily a regenerative system, but it's an organic, very, very productive and, you know, very sustainable system compared to most agricultural systems. But um, uh, the tree lanes, as you can see, I'm going to stop the video here, actually, are quite far apart from each other to allow for machinery access, but also to avoid the competition for light. And also this requires less management. It's less intensive. You only get into... Um, you only manage the rows in terms of the agroforestry rows in terms of pruning and harvesting and they don't cause a lot of problems you might need to weed them every now and then you could add an extra crop at the bottom to avoid weeding something like daffodils like uh, a tallest organic does but essentially this is agroforestry on a kind of silver horticultural scale but in a temperate climate with low levels of sunlight Limited diversity because there's all only fruit trees. There aren't many, many shrubs or vegetables or other things in the agroforestry rows. And the alley is very wide. So it's kind of a soft approach to agro, uh, sorry, to hoto forestry, to uh, market gardening or vegetable farming with agroforestry because it's kind of low maintenance and it's uh, low. Uh, it's not, it's kind of extensive in a way. It's not too intensive in terms of management. Uh, let's have a look at a different system. So this is Tapo North by um, um, James and Rosa in um, in Scotland. Now this is a true market garden. I think it's very small scale. Uh, it's partly no dig, part part minimum till. Um, you can't see a very long video here, but essentially you can watch that videos on online. They they have a beautiful um, um, uh, channel, YouTube channel with a lot of content, and you can see here that there are some. This is the one uh, in the middle, uh, hedgerows or forest garden rows, as they call them, which are more towards what we want. They're very wide here. I think it's two plus meters. I don't know, more than two meters. And there are fruit trees and there are, let's see if towards the end of the video, we can see some of the side. I mean, we can't really see the side um, view of these, but there are fruit trees. There are soft fruit shrubs. There are herbs. Uh, there are there's comfrey, there's nitrogen fixer trees and shrubs. So this is a truly diverse hedgerow style forest garden row, very dense and they're not spaced too much. I think in this case it was one, two, three, four, five. There might be um, ten meters in between these rows. I would I would say no more than that. Uh, and so this is something more towards what we're looking at. Uh, this is again a temperate climate. These don't get pruned very strategically or very heavily. They just get harvested and pruned for production. And they, at this stage, there is not much competition with the vegetables, mostly also because there is a little bit amount of tillage here. And so in terms of root competition, but there is also the fact that these trees are grafted onto dwarfing rootstock. They're not, and there aren't very many tall trees. So there aren't trees planted for very high canopy. Uh, layers and also these fruit trees are not going to get huge they're going to stay within three meters i would say um, here we have another another situation where there isn't so much of a production of a crop uh, but more of a wild uh, life habitat and um, windbreak mitigation of climate type of uh, function being played by the agroforestry rows this is the farm de quatre temps by um, jm fortier in, in canada in quebec and you can see very well here i'm going to stop it here actually this um, hedgerow is full of um, um, autochthonous or native species a lot of them are mainly for pollen wildlife some of them produce food but most of their role is to um, give habitat to wildlife for pest control and uh, also for biodiversity and also to create some microclimate and uh, so these are again are quite thick are quite wide sorry and relatively tall i would say at least three meters four meters i don't know how they they're going to manage this i don't know much about these systems but some of you will have seen um, either james garden in person farm in person or uh, on his videos and so you know what uh, these systems are like in more detail and you can have a look on his website and on his channel uh, again these are kind of widely spaced actually so this um, I think 20 meters or 15 meters between two. These are much closer, but there's only a, a, a track in between. I would say these are more towards 14, 15 meters at least, uh, which is, if you remember earlier, kind of one kind of medium between 10 and 40 meters 
loss of yields in those survivable systems. It would be interesting to have data from these market gardening systems, but nobody has been gathering data showing the production, how it improves or, or uh, decreases due to the uh, interaction with these hedgerows. Okay, so this is kind of uh, slightly larger scale than Roses and James, a slightly smaller scale than Schilling for Organics. Um, and here we have um, um, this Iside farm uh, in Italy, in Sulzano, in the north of Italy. Uh, Matteo Mazzola and, uh, and um, Paola have uh, um, designed these systems and run it. It's a very, very interesting farm with a lot of things going on. I really recommend that you visit it or have a look on, online at uh, their, the material they've shared, an incredible, all, all, you know, a research lab for um, innovative and uh, pioneering techniques of regenerative agriculture on a, on a small and medium scale. And in, in particular here, I, I want to show you the market garden. Um, here you have, um, I think the spacing might be seven meters. Um, I'll look it up, I'll ask Matteo again. But essentially here we have um, vegetable beds, which are no-till beds. And then you have paulonias, the trees that you see, and they're managed for shade and obviously in the long term for timber, but also for obviously ecological services. And there are uh, rows at the bottom which were managed with, uh, which were planted with vegetables the first year. So you can see here some courgette in the world. And then in the long term, they will have comfrey, rhubarb, um, and there are also a lot of um, gooseberries and soft fruit. This is more towards a successional system in that there are timber trees in this system, which are the paulonias, which are pruned every year strategically, as you would a curtain to make either more or less light access the system. And so you have different layers, you have different uh, crops, and you have uh, very, very successional, uh, dynamic successional dynamics um, processes. So in the middle, you have vegetables, very tight spacing. This looks even less than seven meters, doesn't it? So it might be even five meters. And then you have fruit trees. Essentially, this is, you know, really a, an exemplary system that we would like to mimic and learn from and perhaps even push a bit, you know, forwards or or even adapt to our different situations just. Um, so the key here is the successional dynamic, as I've said multiple times already. So there is a tree lane, which was planted with a placenta, as it's called in syntropic gardening. So you have uh, vegetables initially, which prepare the ground for then shrubs, and then you can have a soft fruit and herbaceous perennials, such as comfrey, rhubarb, and things like that. So in the long term, you have a low story, a low stratum, low layer, which produces more shade tolerant crops. And, and you have a lot of fruit and you can use the shading of the top canopy trees, which are not very visible, but in the previous, uh, in, yeah, in this one, perhaps you see some more top canopies around the place, which can be managed for shade and for uh, stimulation of the uh, alley in between. This is a different um, system in which, and I'm gonna go towards uh, talking a little bit more about this, more care has been, um, put into, has been taken into designing for biomass production. So in this system, there is uh, the desire to produce the biomass for the bed. So you can see here, actually, on Matteo's bed, uh, there is mulch. You can see it better here. So these beds are raised with mulch and uh, the mulch is coming from all over the farm and some of it might be imported, I don't know. But uh, you might um, try and produce it really close to the beds themselves. And so have an alternation of biomass beds and productive vegetable beds. So the productive beds are both vegetables and crops. You can see there are some fruit trees here. And the biomass beds are uh, both shrubs and also tree crops. So some of these are planted with willow, poplar. Some of these are with uh, robinia um, and... Um, Paulonia and um, and other trees which are used for biomass either as a coppice or in other ways and in here you have fruit trees um, you see this vegetables on the sides and some shrubs in between so the vegetable production is not isolated from the perennial production but it's all put in one bed and then you have biomass only production in uh, every other bed um, this is a system that seems to produce uh, very, very good quantities of mulch that can be applied right next door, essentially. So you don't have to import compost, wood chip, uh, but you can essentially make it on site. And this is very important, as we will see, if we want to uh, become more and more closed loop, uh, closed loop or self-sufficient in terms of biomass, which is what people do in syntropic systems. And so here we move on to syntropic systems. So syntropic systems are quite complex to explain. I'm not going to attempt to explain what syntropic agriculture is and how these systems work. Unfortunately, the video is not playing very smoothly. I'm, uh, I'm sorry about that. But this is a look at the terror 
um, Job and Tanya's farm in Portugal. And it's a very young system. You see the trees have been planted on brand new rows and then there are very few f uh, vegetable beds in between, which will eventually become also agroforestry beds you know, on a slower time scale. And essentially the idea here is very syntropic, very successional. So in each bed you plant uh, all of the layers and all of the life cycles. So you plant uh, vegetables, you plant herbs, you plant shrubs, you plant trees and you, fruit trees and you plant very tall uh, emergent layer trees for shade, biomass, timber and other things and prunings. And then you have vegetable beds in between, but in time you add in between the vegetable beds more and more uh, trees. And so this will become a forest in the long term. How does that work? How does that suit a vegetable garden, you know, intensive vegetable garden production? We'll see in a minute, because essentially the idea is that you rotate your forest and your vegetable uh, beds. Uh, that's one strategy at least. But essentially, this is to give you an idea of how tight this system is, how narrow the, the alleys are here. Everything is more like a forest garden, um, but it's in a row. You can produce at least for a few years, very systematically, a lot of vegetables in between the, in the alleys, within the alleys. And also you have this very successional, very dynamic successional dy you know, process um, that needs to be managed all the time for pruning. To, you know, see here there's been a, a pruning to cause a pulse in between the rows, but also to produce a lot of mulch. And then a sowing ensued. So you, you get sowing right after the mulching. And then essentially this system is a very, very um, um, regenerative in the sense that you don't need to import much material. In this case, they have imported material to make the vegetable no dig beds initially. But um, in, in time, you won't need uh, much more because essentially uh, by the interaction, uh, interplay of the perennial roots and the biomass that they produce and the vegetables in the middle, you'll create a closed system in which you don't need to in import a lot of biomass. That's the goal. But how do we achieve that goal? How wide can this analyst be uh, in order for this biomass to be sufficient? Can it ever be sufficient? How, you know, how do we play uh, the shade card? If things get too far apart, not only we are short of biomass, but we're going to be short of um, shade. Um, so there are diff different questions to be asked here, and that's what we will try to do with our uh, system in Florence. Um, so this is a truly syntropic agroforestry line, and uh, that's what I wanted to explain to you uh, here, but perhaps it will be a lot easier with this, uh, with this uh, succession of slides. This is a system, this comes from a beautiful booklet made by Gennaro Cardone, and um, and um, he's really done wonders in pioneering this uh, centropic agricultural systems, which were developed in Brazil in a, in a tropical climate to the Mediterranean climate of Portugal and in Italy. And I, I really recommend that you look up his work in Portugal and in Italy because he's done uh, amazing, amazing things. And here you see a typically Mediterranean system with a lavender robinia as a nitrogen fixing and emergent crop pioneer tree. This can be planted on any soil very degraded with very little biomass. The idea is that these entropic systems can be used to revegetate a desert and make it productive within less than a decade. Um, so it's very adaptable to systems where there is access, very poor access to anything, uh, apart from perhaps trees and cuttings. So what in this system, this is very Mediterranean, so it would work well in, you know, in Italy, for example, or in Portugal, you have robinia, garlic, lavender, uh, um, sorry, blackberries, um, uh, globe artichokes, pears, um, arbutus onedo, that, that would be a strawberry tree, uh, peach, etc, uh, etc. Et so you have different layers, different life cycles. Uh, you have fruit trees, which are going to be the medium to high stra stratum or layer. Apologies, then you have the emergent tree, which is robinia, which you use as a service tree, as a support tree for pruning and for um, nitrogen fixation and for shade but also to improve the soil, because obviously Robinia is a pioneer tree, so it's adapted in very poor soils. Then you have the aromatic herbs, which will produce a crop, but also will, again, prepare the soil for more abundant and, and uh, demanding crops. And so this is in the first part of the year, in October, November. Then when you go to April, May, in the spring, you see already the trees are growing and there is a bit of pruning involved in removing the broad beans and uh, garlic and the maize, the um, uh, sweet corn, which were planted as a placenta, as an early crop of vegetables in the row, which uh, protects the trees, which are still young, um, but also 
produces a crop, as I've said, and uh, stimulates the biological activity of the soil, um, uh, which is something that would happen in a forest in the early stages of succession. You'd have annuals, such as the vegetables that we've described, uh, work the soil and prepare it for then herbaceous perennials and then shrubs, etc., etc. So the role of the placenta is that of preparing the ground and also of producing a crop. And then you have, uh, so a lot of these vegetables are pruned and left on the ground for biomass. And some of these, so so they're more of a green manure or cover crop, really. And some of them are harvested. I think Gennaro says that 30% uh, can be harvested as a crop and the other 70% is usually left on the ground as biomass. Uh, here you, you are in the summer. So removing also the, the maize, the sweet corn. And here in the first winter, the second year, if you want the second season, and uh, harvesting also vegetables that were planted in summer, cabbages and things like that. And then again in spring, this is the accumulation phase where the fruit trees are starting to grow under the protection of the uh, emergent trees that go to flower and therefore get pruned very heavily to stimulate the system. Because remember, I've talked about this a lot in previous videos, when a plant goes to flower, it becomes very demanding. It takes resources away from the soil and competes with the plants nearby. If you prune it though, it will become Corporate, cooperative. It will become very stimulating, stimulating to the neighboring plants via the mycorrhizal network in the soil that shares plant hormones and other substances. Now, there's very little scientific evidence of this, but there starts to be some. Um, uh, I mean, there is already scientific evidence of this. Let me um, correct myself. But there isn't systematic evidence that this increases production or reduces competition between crops. Um, and so here we are pruning the robinia and the fruit trees are starting to come to, into production. And then, you know, on the lower layer, there won't be as many vegetables now because there's more shade and there will be more perennial production of herbs and soft fruits and things like that. So you have the blackberry starting to climb up on top of the robinia, which becomes a pole, essentially. And um, the global artichokes still producing, the herbs still producing, and so on and so forth, but not so many annuals now. And then five years later, this is five years on, the robinia has been pruned to produce shade only in limited amounts. The fruit trees are producing already some fruit, you can see it here. Um, the uh, long-term um, strawberry tree is growing faster and faster, and uh, in the lower layers there's less and less plants now, but some strategic ones like the um, uh, prickly pear and uh, which is very good for moisture production and for soil improvement uh, which gets pruned all the time in these systems and then you have uh, harvesting of these plants that now are shaded out like the lavender and the thyme they won't produce anymore the globe artichoke has been removed as well because there's too much shade now so in the lower layers you only have shade tolerant crops but you have a lot of abundance developing at the top this is still the accumulation phase a lot of biomass has been produced you can see here a lot of compost has been building up on the soil as a result of the pruning and biomass slavering uh, and mulching that's ensued and finally in the abundance phase 10 years on you have a system that resembles more like a forest garden you have strawberries and soft fruit at the bottom you have um, strawberry tree fruit trees and the robinia, remember the robinia that was here, the um, black locust has been removed completely because the pioneering role that it played has been fulfilled. And now you can have a productive forest, um, which is more stable and resilient. You, you might, your question might be, what happens next? Do we leave it like this? Because these fruit trees might become senescent and need replacing. Yes, indeed, they do. And we'll talk about that later. But this is to give you an idea of all, how uh, these systems evolve. Uh, the agroforestry rows can evolve like this. And um, okay, so let's move on now. We've had a look at different systems where uh, we move more towards small scale, uh, high, high, you know, high intensity, uh, highly successional, dynamic and diversified systems like the zootropic ones. Uh, can you produce a lot of vegetables in these systems though? You can, and one of the ideas that I've liked the most in this space, one of the most innovative and revolutionary in my ideas, the, the ones that have been uh, shared by Scott Hall in Australia. So I really uh, encourage you to look at his channel, his website and his Facebook page. They, he shares a lot of very, very high quality material there um, and, and a lot of uh, thought provoking ideas. In these systems, there is a lot of biomass being produced on site. No biomass is imported ever. And um, there are tree, tree crops grown alongside vegetables. So I'm going to take you through a journey here. Um, I hope, you know, Scott can correct me if I do anything wrong here, but hopefully the, the ideas behind it are correct. I don't really know exactly what's happening here uh, in, in detail, but I'm, I'm going to try and interpret these photos that he's shared. So here we have cucumbers, which are climbing up this trellis system. Um, and then you have ginger 
on the neighboring row. See that all of the time there are tree rows on the side, very tight. This is a hot climate with bananas and other trees and there might be um, crops um, on the, in the shrub layer. So this is a heavily stratified system with uh, emergent trees, very high uh, ones. And then you have uh, banana for biomass and fruit. And then you have um, shrubs and other things in, in the lower layers and also some trees that would have been planted as a seed to become the uh, climax phase of this system, product producing uh, fruit or stuff like that or timber. And in between in the alleys you have a lot of grass which is producing biomass, mulch, on site as a green manure. And then you have crops. You have ginger here. You, can, you can't really see it now, but there you have cucumbers as well. In the second photo you see what's happened after uh, a, a cut. So the grasses have been cut. These grasses are actually oats if I'm not mistaken, and they get crimped, uh, cut, uh, and um, laid on the ground, and then Swiss chard is transplanted, and it's growing in the middle. The same thing has happened here, the, the ginger, uh, so the Swiss chard has replaced the cucumber, I believe, and the ginger now has grown through, and the oats have also been cut and used as a mulch. Look at the trees also, they've been pruned very heavily uh, uh, quite recently in this photo. Okay, so you have production of biomass, still happening here alongside and also so you don't need to import any material any compost any mulch any hay anything and you have the vegetables succeeding one one another and also production of perennials so here we have the sec the following stage um fruit trees now a lot more mature uh swiss chard still, still growing the the oats are still now coming through the ginger has been harvested partly but still some growing in there and uh, the chart is now going to come out and you can see here it's been cut down um, used as a mulch with the oats so and some of it is still growing there <coughs> and so what's going to come next onto this bed after the all these cuts is the um uh the cool jets uh, and so the cool jets now are growing on top of this mulch through this mulch sorry of swiss chard and oats and alongside more swiss chard here and um, again the tree rose as usual um, and uh, finally you can see here when you know in the long term you can plant also re um, in every alley you can start planting some bananas or other fruit trees to produce even more biomass and to make this more into a forest in the longer term with less and less vegetable production and more and more high value fruit or timber or whatever type of perennial shade uh, production you can have. It can be coffee in tropical climates, but it can be uh, soft fruit in, um, in temperate climates. So again, this is highly successful because this is becoming a forest, a productive forest, but it's starting from vegetables. Not only it's starting from vegetables, but it's starting with zero biomass input. I want to emphasize that this is a no-till garden with agroforestry rows in a hot climate with zero biomass inputs. Um, so it is a fantastic system, highly successful, and it goes towards a forest. And, uh, you know, you can do a lot of interplanting. You can do high density, biointensive growing. It's, it's really great. And so I really encourage you to look at this interaction between the cover crop, um, uh, grasses, can be oats, can be very, very vigorous rhizomatous grasses, can be all sorts of things, producing biomass on site for your vegetable beds. Um, yeah, and so these are more photos from this system. Uh, the time evolution of these systems is very important, and I've been talking about it a little bit, but so let me take care of that aspect, which is, I think, one of the most important revolutionary aspects in syntropic and regenerative agroforestry. The idea is this. You have a vegetable field, and you've also planted your agroforestry rows. In this case, they have a placenta of maize, and they might have other things on the ground. Rocket. There's some rocket going flower there. So you have vegetable beds in the middle and agroforestry rows on the side. Okay? In time, you get a system like this. The trees start to grow. There's still a lot of light. You can regulate the amount of light you get in by pruning, uh, crown lifting the trees and um, stimulating them, etc., etc. But in the long term scenario, you will have something more like that uh, a, a garden which is more and more dense, more and more shaded. And it will become, if you know what you're doing, it will become a very productive uh, garden. It could produce anything, coffee, tea, if you're in the tropics, or you can produce soft fruit, a uh, top fruit, um, uh, timber, mushrooms, anything. So it, obviously, this at this stage, it's a better system in terms of its lower maintenance, its higher value per square meter, and it's also storing a lot more carbon and it's more 
uh, biodiverse, but it doesn't produce vegetables anymore. And you do want to produce vegetables, either because you have a market or because you want to produce them for yourself. What do you do? The key to success is succession. So this is Hans Koch, the, the pioneer and founder of this idea, you know, if you want the creator of the syntropic agricultural movement in Brazil. You can open spaces in between the forest and grow vegetables in there. This is what happens in nature anyway. I've discussed this in articles and also other videos. You'd have an opening in a forest due to animal disturbance or to climatic events. And in that opening, the annual seed bank would be triggered to stimulate um, growth at the lower level of plants that are mostly pioneers and so resembles resemble weeds and resemble vegetables because this is a spiral every time you have a disturbance you have more biomass on the ground that's been um, layered and so every time you can have more demanding crops growing on the ground layer so if you have very disturbed soil with very little biomass organic matter you have uh, weeds growing but lower down the line you know if you have a disturbance in 10 years or 20 years in that case you have a ground which is full of organic matter and so you might have different types of stimulation you can have different types of herbaceous things like soft fruit um, or mushroom production and, and stuff like that so we're trying to think how we can mimic natural succession to transform this system which goes from a vegetable garden to a forest back into a vegetable garden well hi, here you have your solution you create an opening and this has been done very successful in brazil in tropical climates especially in brazil where they create essentially a forest which is highly productive and produces coffee on the ground and lots and lots of fruits and lots of other things cacao and emergent trees eucalyptus and stuff like that but then they fell an area and create a vegetable garden when they do that, they also plant, again, the syntropic agroforestry lines. You see them there? So vegetables and trees. So in time, this will become a forest again. And then you will need to cut another part of the forest. Every time you cut, you have a lot of organic material that's been released, that's been layered. And so you're creating a fantastic vegetable garden because you have all of this composting in situ. Okay, so you're using nature to produce biomass, to produce ecological services, to produce shade, to produce crops, to produce low maintenance crops such as fruits, timber, etc., etc. And then you use nature again and its processes to recreate the vegetable garden, which gives you your um, your crops that you have in your diet as a daily input. And so here you can see it again. This was again all forest and it's been planted again, opened, fell felled and then opened again and then planted with agroforestry and vegetables in between so you can see an opening in the forest which becomes a vegetable garden and look at how beautiful this looks again surrounded by forest an opening that grows vegetables and then this will become a forest and a new area will become a vegetable growing uh, garden and this um inter you know this succession of old growth forest with domesticated forest um with openings and uh, settlements is something that the amazonian people have been doing for for probably centuries and uh, it's been rediscovered by Ernst Koch, but it's nothing new if you want if you want it's been adapted with the knowledge we have now and contextualized to our uh, diets and our systems of production um, and so i'm going to stop here in terms of examples and in the next video i'm going to talk about how we bring together all of these elements into the design of what a, will be our new farm ortoforesta living soil garden in Florence. So a lot of the elements that we've seen in this video will come together in, in, uh, in, uh, in, on this site to try and research and explore different, uh, different ideas and how they work in our context.